I just hit 16 and instead of a birthday bash, I got the boot from my own house. No cake, no happy birthday, nada. Just a swift kick out because my sis Karen, the golden child at 22, is expecting. With a bun in the oven and our place having only four rooms, my folks decided my birthday gift should be shipping me off to my aunts. Talk about a plot twist, right? So here I am, freshly 16 and homeless because baby makes three and apparently I don't make the cut. Seriously, my folks have always been champs at the bare minimum game, especially when it comes to me. But getting the boot on my birthday? That's a new low, even for them. I mean, I've mastered the art of expecting zilch to avoid disappointment. Yet here they are, outdoing themselves in the letdown department. And get this, they had their serious faces on the whole time. Not a single hint of a joke or a lame prank attempt in sight. It was all 100% pack your bags, you're moving to aunties. Unreal, right? After dropping the bombshell that they needed my room for the new baby and declaring I was old enough to live elsewhere, we hit this awkward silence, like a total dead air moment. Then they toss in this bit about still covering my bills until I'm 18, promising I won't starve or anything, as if that's supposed to smooth things over. But the kicker? They straight up said keeping me under the same roof just wasn't in the cards anymore. Yeah, because apparently space for me is where they draw the line. I tried not to get into a fight, but I couldn't help asking why not just turn the guest room into the nursery. After a bit of hemming and hawing, they finally spilled the beans. They'd reserve that space for Karen's boyfriend to crash. So let's break it down. My parents have their sanctuary. Karen and her plus one snag a spot, and even the unborn kid gets its own digs. And me? Well, I'm apparently the odd one out in this room roulette. Karen was conveniently MIA during this whole showdown, probably to dodge the guilt trip of seeing me get the boot. Despite our age difference, we've never really been at each other's throats. Our vibe was more like courteous roommates than siblings. But this move? If she's on board with shipping me off to make room for her upcoming bundle of joy and her boyfriend, it's a cold splash of reality. Maybe she's not the sister I thought she knew after all. The sting was sharper because it all went down on my birthday, but I kept my mouth shut and just nodded. I've come to terms with the fact that my parents are a lost cause. No words of mine will ever make them love me the way I wished they would. That harsh truth has sunk in deep. So, after getting the move out memo and being told to crash with my aunt, I trudged up to my room, not to sulk, but to pack. It was a silent concession to a battle I realized I'd never win. They pitched in with the packing, but it felt more like they were hurrying me along than offering genuine help. When it was time to go, they drove me to my aunt's, chatting away as if we were on some happy family outing, completely oblivious to my silence and the world passing by outside my window. At my aunt's doorstep, there was no goodbye hug, no kiss, just a quick drop off. My aunt, on the other hand, greeted me with open arms. She's always been more like a mother to me, genuinely enjoying my presence and showing me the love my own parents couldn't muster. I opened up to her about the whole ordeal, pouring out my disappointment. She was stunned, asking me to go over the details again, as if she couldn't believe what she was hearing. So I repeated everything that had taken place that morning, and her smile was instantly replaced with a frown. She didn't say anything to me, but grabbed her phone and said that she had to make a call and went to the other room. I didn't hear anything for some time, but then I heard the sound of my aunt fighting on the phone in a high voice. And that's rare because my aunt rarely ever screams at people, and she's a really soft-spoken person, so I knew someone must have pissed off. Pretty bad for her to lose her temper like this. Then she came back to the room, all red in the face and still looking very annoyed. And I learned that it was apparently my parents who had pissed off so badly. Turns out my dad spun this whole narrative to my aunt that I was the one who came up with the grand idea of moving out for the baby's sake. He made it seem like I was all for leaving my childhood home behind to bunk with my aunt. That's the only reason she was cool with the arrangement. She thought I wanted this. She's seen the tension at my house, sure, but believing I'd volunteer to leave was a stretch she accepted because my dad said so. My aunt, being the independent soul she is, in her late 30s with no plans for marriage or kids, didn't see a problem with me moving in. To her, I was just a new roommate, an addition to her single life, not a burden. And since my dad promised to foot the bill for all my needs, she didn't see any financial downsides to letting me stay. It's a setup that worked out, based on a story far from the truth. My aunt liked me, and she thought that I was the one who wanted to live with her, so she agreed to this arrangement. But now that she knew the truth, she'd called my dad up to confront him about it, because what they'd done was messed up, and she had to give them a piece of her mind. After the phone call, she was really upset, and so was I, because this was something I don't think any other kid my age goes through often. 
I'd always known they liked my sister more than me, but this was a little extreme. They literally lied to my aunt to cover this up because they knew how insanely horrible this was. They'd literally chosen to give up the guest room for Karen's boyfriend who's in his 20s and has a job and lives in his own apartment. If they wanted to make it work, Karen could have easily moved in with her boyfriend. But it was my parents' insistence that she'd been living at home because they wanted to be closer to her. And they were ready to even sacrifice my comfort just to keep her close. I was very hurt, and so I decided to go online, expose my parents for whatever they'd been doing. I didn't know if my aunt would be on board with it or not, so I waited for her to leave the room for a nap. In a whirlwind of emotion, I poured everything into a post on my phone, detailing not just the cold birthday eviction, but the years of feeling like an outsider in my own family. It was more than a recount. It was a raw, unfiltered glimpse into my breakdown, a moment of vulnerability where I laid bare the neglect and favoritism I'd endured. The act of typing it all out was cathartic yet heartbreaking, and by the time I hit post, tears were streaming down my face. I powered off my phone, a part of me terrified of the fallout from my digital confession. Trying to distract myself, I picked up a book, but the words blurred, my thoughts elsewhere. Time slipped by in a haze until my aunt, sensing something amiss, found me. Her approach was gentle, a calm in the storm, as she inquired about whether I'd shared something online. The concern in her voice was palpable, a stark contrast to the dismissal I'd felt from my parents. I truthfully told her that I had, and that was it. There was no further discussion about it, so I switched on my phone and then saw that the post had been seen by several people in our family, and I'd received a lot of texts from my parents, and even from my sister in the meantime. A lot of my relatives have commented on the post and expressed how they were on my side. Some of them had even texted me and reached out to tell me that they were always there for me if I needed any help whatsoever. That was uplifting, and I felt better until I went through my parents' messages, all of which were filled with hate and anger. Obviously, they weren't pleased with what I had done and were demanding that I take the post down. My dad had said a lot of things about me in his texts, and even added that he wished I'd never been born, which was hurtful, but unsurprising. My mom's texts were along the same lines, and the only ones that were even slightly different were my sister's. She didn't say much, but told me that she'd like to speak to me in person if that was possible, and left it at that. I didn't know what to say to any of that, was just very overwhelmed by all the people I had to respond to. So I just kept my phone aside again and didn't say anything to anyone for the next couple of days. But what I did was block my parents because I didn't have any intention of talking to them anymore. With the law on my side ensuring my parents' financial support until I'm 18, I saw no reason to maintain any relationship with them. My aunt, now my rock, seemed to agree. If my dad reached out to her in the aftermath, she gave no indication, and we moved forward as if the world outside our solidarity hadn't shifted. Her unwavering stance was all the affirmation I needed. Her support was my sanctuary in this upheaval. In the silent days that followed, my parents became distant memories, their presence in my life reduced to the bare legalities. But then, out of nowhere, they appeared at my school, their expressions stormy with disapproval. My friends clued into the family saga rallied around me. They formed a protective circle, a barrier of loyalty, ensuring I didn't have to face my parents unless I chose to. In that moment, surrounded by my friend's resolve, I felt a strength I hadn't known before, bolstered by the knowledge that I wasn't facing this alone. But they kept yelling out my name and I had to respond. I walked right up to both of them and told them that I didn't want anything to do with them anymore, but they didn't pay any heed to that and told me that I needed to come home with them right away. I didn't understand why all of a sudden they wanted me to return with them when they made it so clear in the past that I was not a priority for them at all and felt like this was just them trying to redeem their image and reputation among their family members. So I told them that I wasn't going anywhere with them until they told me what was going on as a way to try to get to know why they were acting like this. All of a sudden, on one hand, they looked pissed off and on the other. They still wanted me to come back home with them. They told me that they didn't want my friends hearing this, so I told them to back off a little so I could speak to them in private. Once my friends were out of earshot, my parents told me that they were here to take me back because I wasn't answering any of their calls or texts, and they needed me to come back so that they'd be able to get their inheritance still. They explained that after I'd made that post, pretty much everyone in the family had become aware of the situation and it had reached my grandparents. My paternal grandparents are quite well off, and they frightened my dad by saying that if they continued to treat me like this, then he'd lose his inheritance. They'd been told that if they didn't try and reconcile with me, treat me better, and make sure I was loved and looked after, then whatever my father was supposed to inherit would end up going to my aunt, since she was the one taking care of me even though she didn't need to. 
and my dad couldn't afford to lose the inheritance. In the complex weave of family dynamics and financial interests, my parents' sudden appearance wasn't just about reconciliation or concern, it was tethered to a substantial inheritance, a detail that cast their motives in a starkly pragmatic light. Despite their considerable income, the allure of added wealth was tempting, a sentiment I could understand from a purely logical standpoint. Yet, had our roles been reversed, I would have approached the situation with more tact and authenticity, not masquerading self-interest as benevolence. Their attempt to persuade me to return, framed as if they were extending me a favor, only highlighted their self-serving agenda. In truth, their actions were for their benefit, not mine, a reality they failed to disguise with any semblance of genuine concern. My response was dismissive, an explicit rejection of their financial maneuvers. I refused to be swayed by their pleas, walking away as their calls fell on deaf ears. The journey back to my aunt's house was a quiet reflection of the day's tumult. Upon sharing the ordeal, my aunt's frustration mirrored my own, prompting her to seek legal counsel. The aim was clear, to explore the possibility of altering the custody arrangement. Despite the current legal standing that favored my parents, the pursuit of a change was driven by a desire for stability and genuine care under my aunt's guardianship, a stark contrast to the conditional support offered by my parents. I also called up and thanked my grandparents for trying to fix this, but I also told them that I really didn't want to go back to living with my parents because now that I spent a couple of days living with my aunt, I finally felt like I was free. Living with my parents had been nothing short of suffocating and I kept hoping that things would change, but they never did. My grandparents didn't live in the same city, so we didn't meet often. But whenever we did family gatherings and the holidays, my parents were always on their best behavior so they wouldn't know how I was treated at home. It wasn't as if I was treated with cruelty, but it was more like ignorance and avoidance on the surface. It all seemed fine. But if people spent a couple of days with me at my parents' house, they'd know that they mostly pretended I wasn't even there and cared only about my sister. And after she got pregnant, that just got worse and I was pushed to the sidelines altogether. So I told my grandparents all of this, and they reassured me that if that's what I wanted to live with my aunt, then they'd make sure that it happens. The prospect of my parents relinquishing their rights, coupled with their commitment to ensure my financial needs were met, brought a fleeting sense of relief and optimism. It felt like a turning point, a hopeful departure from the instability that had marred my recent experiences. Yet, this sense of progress was abruptly interrupted by an email from my dad, casting a shadow over the newfound hope. His message was devoid of anger or malice, but carried a weight of disappointment that was palpable. He critiqued my decision to share our family's private matters online, suggesting that such revelations were unnecessary and that the family fallout could have been contained within the family, inevitably reaching my grandparents through my aunt. The consequences of my public disclosure extended beyond familial disapproval. It had ramifications on their social standing within the broader family network and my dad's professional life, as co-workers stumbled upon the post, inadvertently dragged into our personal saga. The email underscored his perception of my actions as a source of unnecessary drama, attributing the backlash they faced from relatives and his professional circle to my decision to make our private discord public. His words, intended or not, imposed a burden of guilt for the repercussions they endured as a result of my attempt to find solace and understanding in a broader community. In his narrative, the complexities of our family dynamic, the pain of being displaced on my birthday for the sake of convenience, were reduced to an episode of drama, an oversimplification that overlooked the depth of hurt and isolation that prompted my initial post. The situation laid bare the intricate dance between seeking personal vindication and navigating the fallout of public disclosure, a balance between the need for validation and the unintended consequences of seeking it in a public forum. Update 1. First off, a huge thank you to everyone who took a moment to support me through your comments on my post. It's been overwhelming to see so much kindness from strangers, and it truly means the world to me. So, thank you truly. I've seen a lot of questions about why I didn't leave my parents' house sooner, especially given that my grandparents and aunts seemed ready to support me. It's complex, but the truth is, my home life wasn't marked by overt cruelty or abuse. As I shared before, it wasn't that I was treated badly in an obvious way. It was more about feeling ignored and like I didn't belong. That kind of neglect is a form of mistreatment too, albeit a quieter, more insidious one. In my head, I rationalized my situation by telling myself that as long as I wasn't being physically harmed or verbally abused, I was okay. I had the basics, a roof over my head and food on the table. That was enough for me to justify staying to convince myself that I didn't need the emotional nourishment of feeling loved or valued. It was a survival mechanism of sorts, 
a way to cope with the emotional void by lowering my expectations to the bare minimum. But this ordeal has been eye-opening, revealing the deep-seated need for emotional connection and the profound impact of its absence. I didn't realize that I was being neglected because it had become so normalized for me. And as for why I didn't approach my family for help, I just didn't want to burden them. I was also worried about what would happen if they refused to help me out, and somehow my parents found out that would be very bad for me at home, since my parents care a lot about appearances and stuff. And that's really why I just kept everything to myself and tried to deal with everything while suffering in silence. My aunt didn't offer to take me in herself because she didn't want to insult my parents, and she wasn't even sure if I'd want to come live with her. So we didn't do this earlier. But now that this is what's happened organically, I guess it all worked out for the best. It happened a little late, but still better late than never. She's in talks with a lawyer right now to get my custody rights transferred to her. And it's going to be a hell of a task to convince my parents to give up their rights, since now the inheritance is at stake. But even if this goes to court, I know that my grandparents and aunt will have my back. My aunt's recent apologies have added a layer of healing to this entire situation. She's expressed regret over not reaching out to me sooner, recognizing the neglect I endured under my parents' roof. Her hindsight insight is bittersweet. It's comforting to finally have my feelings acknowledged. Yet there's a pang of sadness for all the years of missed connections. This acknowledgement, however, has cleared the air and significantly lightened the emotional load I've been carrying, casting a hopeful glow on the path forward. Regarding my sister, her reaching out has thrown me into a state of uncertainty. In the wake of everything, her text asking to meet in person left me at a loss for words, leading me to ignore it initially. Our relationship has always been marked by a certain distance, mirroring the emotional detachment characteristic of my parents, yet she was never outright unkind to me. The assumption that she was behind the push to have me move out, making room for her expanding family, soured my perception of her. It felt like a betrayal, intensifying the sense of isolation from my family. However, her attempt to reach out suggests there might be more to her side of the story, hinting at complexities I hadn't considered. The possibility that she might not be the antagonist I'd painted her to be in my mind is both confusing and a potential avenue for reconciliation. As much as I had prepared myself for further alienation, her gesture opens the door to a conversation that could either mend fences or confirm my fears. Navigating this uncertainty is daunting, but it also presents a sliver of hope that there might still be room for understanding and healing within my fractured family. So I didn't get back to her. We had a weird, tense, strained relationship, but I still liked her better than my parents, since she'd be nice to me whenever we did speak. And it wasn't her fault that my parents liked her more than me. So when? Three days ago, she texted me again and asked me to visit her. I decided to call her and ask why she wanted to see me. I wasn't going to go back home, which is where I assumed she'd be. But to my surprise, she told me that she was living with her boyfriend at the moment and wasn't feeling very well enough to go out. So she was asking me to come to see her so we could have a discussion about everything going on in the family. She told me that she had a lot of things that she wanted to talk to me about. So out of curiosity, I did go see her. Once I got there, she first apologized to me for never speaking up for me, even though she knew that our parents were playing favorites and never favored me. They'd always ignored all my achievements to celebrate hers, and I was always the least wanted kid. The revelation from my sister paints a vastly different picture than the one I had initially conjured up in my mind. Her apology and subsequent explanation shed light on her own struggles and the miscommunications within our family. It turns out, her silence was not complicity, but discomfort, and a misconception that I was content with the status quo. Her admission of regret for not intervening speaks volumes, acknowledging the role she played, however passive, in the perpetuation of my neglect. Learning that the decision to oust me from the house was made without her input was a shock. My sister was as blindsided by our parents' actions as I was, dismantling the narrative that she was the architect of my displacement. Her intentions had been far from wanting to uproot me. She had her exit strategy, planning to move in with her boyfriend post-birth, a plan prematurely accelerated by the fallout from my public disclosure. Her swift move following our confrontation with reality signifies a stand against our parents' expectations and decisions made at my expense. The fallout from her departure, marked by accusations of ingratitude and selfishness, underscores the dysfunction in our family dynamics, where assumptions have long substituted for open dialogue. This turn of events, while tumultuous, reveals my sister not as an adversary, but as another victim of our parents' manipulative tactics. This newfound understanding between us might not repair all the years of distance and missed connections overnight, but it's a step toward healing. 
It's a complex tapestry of emotions and miscommunications. Yet in this chaos, there's a glimmer of hope for rebuilding, not just for my relationship with my sister, but for each of us as individuals seeking to navigate the aftermath of our family's unraveling. So all that drama was for nothing. Ultimately, since my parents ended up losing both their kids, at least she apologized to me for being a bad sister and a bad person in general, which I forgave her for because I don't think choosing to be unforgiving and cold is going to help me in any way. We talked things out and she told me the same thing that my aunt did, that from this point on, she'd be there for me no matter what. So that was nice. It's been a little less than a week since my original post and I still haven't heard from my parents after the email. So I'm guessing they've given up on trying to get me back. I'm sure my grandparents must have had something to do with it since they did call me in the middle to tell me that my parents wouldn't be bothering me anymore and that I didn't need to worry about them showing up at my school or emailing me again. I hadn't told them about the email that dad had sent, so I'm assuming that my parents and grandparents must have talked about things. I don't know what they would have talked about, but I'm sure my parents have given up now. Update to just three days have passed since my last update, and today my aunt told me that my parents have agreed to give up their parental rights and the paperwork and stuff will be complete soon. She'll be taking over the legal aspect of my custody soon, and I have mixed feelings. I'm happy that I'm finally going to have a home where I don't constantly feel unwanted and unneeded, but I'm also kind of empty and sad about some things. I feel weird that this is finally happening, but this is for the best. This is what I wanted. Update 3. Big news update from my corner of the world. It's official, my aunt is now my legal guardian, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. But wait till you hear the kicker. Turns out my parents decided to let me go, not out of some sudden moral awakening, but because my grandparents laid down an ultimatum. It was either say goodbye to me and keep half their inheritance, or cling to their old ways and lose it all. So what did they choose? Obviously the cash. Honestly, I'm not even shocked. It just confirms I made the right call. At this point, I'm just glad to be out of there and with someone who actually cares. And in a twist I didn't see coming, I'm still keeping in touch with my sister amidst all this drama. My parents? Well, they're scrambling to make amends before she has her baby, but she's taking some much needed space. Looks like I'm not the only one making big moves. So she's told them that she wants her space and they need to stop bothering her every day. At this point, I can't help but just laugh at what a pathetic mess they've made of our own family. But whatever, I'm happy with my aunt and that's all that matters. When I was 28, my world got rocked. My then husband, Ethan, who was only 27, suddenly hit me with divorce papers. Can you believe it? I never saw it coming. I thought we were the perfect team living the dream, but nope, out of the blue, he decided to bail. It was like a sudden plot twist in a movie, totally unexpected. Unfortunately, this year I was thrown into a real life nightmare. I got caught in a hit and run, landing me in the hospital. To make matters worse, my insurance barely covered anything and the person responsible vanished without a trace. My bank account took a massive hit, wiping out my savings. Because of my injuries, I couldn't even climb the five flights of stairs to my apartment anymore. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, I lost my job. It was like everything was crashing down around me, one of the toughest times in my life. Ethan and I hadn't spoken in ages, but out of the blue he reached out. He offered me a place to stay, in one of his spare rooms no less. I was cornered with nowhere else to turn. I tried to pay him rent, but he wouldn't take a dime. He's got a maid for all the housework, so I chip in by cooking occasionally. It's an alright setup. He's always buzzing with energy and conversation. Sometimes when I close my eyes, it almost feels like we're back to being friends just like old times. We never crossed that line again into being a couple or having to go through another divorce. Just recently, my old friend Sophia from way back when called me up. She was feeling sorry about my situation and wanted to make sure I found a place to stay. When I mentioned I was living with Ethan, she was adamant about coming over to see us. She even has a daughter now. Sophia wanted to visit because she too had been friends with Ethan and had chosen not to take sides back then. When Sophia showed up, she immediately dove into how she thought I was in a bad spot. She quizzed me about whether I was paying rent. I admitted I wasn't. Then she hit me with this warning saying that Ethan's sympathy wouldn't last forever. She even asked if I wanted to live like a beggar for the rest of my life. I stood my ground, telling her I was no beggar. But she didn't seem convinced and said she'd spread the word to her friends. Sophia said that if I didn't think that what I was doing was wrong, I wouldn't have cared if she told everyone. I felt humiliated and ashamed. I have been avoiding her. She called me yesterday and said that I was being childish and emotionally manipulative for behaving that way. Am I the a-hole? Well, Opie, in my opinion, no, you are not the a-hole. 
I'm not sure that living with your ex-husband is the best thing to do, you know, thinking about emotional health, but it was apparently the only person that offered to help out. So yeah, you're not the a-hole, and to be honest, she doesn't sound like much of a friend to me. After everything you went through, like losing your job, losing your apartment, losing your savings because somebody crashed into you, which of course, absolutely sucks. She completely overlooked the physical pain and struggles I've been through. Just because Ethan, someone I used to be with, stepped in to help and refused rent, which I did offer, by the way, she labeled me a beggar. And then, to drive her point home, she even threatened to tell all our friends about my situation. Obviously, that's the last thing I'd want broadcasted to everyone. It's not something I'd go around advertising. It's a private thing. It's personal. I'd have to say that's manipulation. Or at least that's some sort of emotional blackmail. If you don't do what I tell you to do, which is to leave this place of somebody that's helping you out, I'm going to tell everybody, you know, go off yourself. Sophia Opie. In my opinion, you have nothing to be ashamed about. So if she wants to go about advertising your business, the only one that's going to look bad is her. She's going to turn into a gossip, and you can call her out for being a gossip. And what do you guys think about OP's situation? What is your judgment and what would you do if you were in her shoes? Drop your thoughts in the comments section below. Now let's dive into what the community has to say. Realistichead40-79 commented, Definitely not the jerk. Your friend Sophia is being a busybody, poking her nose where it doesn't belong. Her comments were harsh, judgmental, and probably not even close to the truth. You should consider limiting how much you interact with her and remember, you don't owe anyone an explanation for your choices except maybe to yourself. To this, OP replied, I'm not trying to be a beggar. I totally offered to pay my way, even said I'd scrub floors or do whatever chores needed doing. But guess what? He's already got a cleaning crew on the payroll. He's Mr. Takeout King, always eating food from somewhere else. But he never says no to the meals I cook. That's my way of saying thanks, you know? Then out of nowhere, Crazy House 12 jumps into the chat and blasts, Definitely not the jerk here! Who does Sophia think she is? Some sort of queen? It's none of her business what you do. And when I saw that, I just had to reply, Sophia's always up in my grill, acting like she knows best. She's been like this since forever, always telling me I'm messing up, like when I married Ethan. It's like living in a crazy drama show. She warned me that Ethan would get tired of me, and guess what? She wasn't wrong. Ever since then, she's been waving that I told you so flag like it's some kind of trophy, acting like she's the ultimate know-it-all. But really, Sophia's just an absolute, full-on Alaskan puppy, and not in a good way. Then, out of the blue, Mom says chimes in, You're not the bad guy here, and neither is anyone who sides with you. This whole thing, it's just between you and Ethan, nobody else. Just focus on getting back on your feet. It's like everyone's got an opinion in this wild soap opera of a situation. And then I hit back with, absolutely, I'm on it. I'm pinching every penny, saving up to move out and get my life back on track. But wait, there's more to the story. I added in the comments, I'm working hard to pick myself up. Sophia, she just doesn't get it. Not everyone's got the golden ticket like she does. She was born into money and then married into even more. So, she's clueless about how us regular middle-class folks handle a whopping $120,000 medical bill. It's not like we can just cough up that kind of cash without draining our life savings. Sophia's living the dream life, like seriously next-level privileged. Imagine this, her family's been covering her rent forever, and she's sitting on a trust fund so massive, it's like a never-ending gold mine that'll last her family for like two to three generations. But that's not all. She's super smart, like genius-level smart. This probably makes her think she's invincible, like she can't fail no matter what she does. And here's the kicker. She's convinced that I'm just mooching off Ethan because I'm not paying rent. Can you believe that? She's got all this dough and still thinks I'm the one taking advantage. I've totally tried to pay Ethan, but he's just not having it. We end up spending a bunch of time talking about all sorts of stuff like movies, philosophy, and science. Get this, he even falls asleep in the room I'm using, which I borrow from him. He's got this idea that if he's using the room too, then I'm not really a renter and shouldn't have to pay. Makes sense, right? But when I try to explain this to Sophia, she just doesn't get it. She keeps saying I shouldn't have taken his help if I was going to be greedy. Seriously, I've tried paying, but she's stuck on this idea that I'm taking advantage of the situation. So, Sophia's all about this pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. She's big on everyone fending for themselves. No handouts, no calling mommy and daddy for help. She did offer to help me scout for apartments or put out a word for a ground level place. But that's as far as her assistance goes. And let me tell you, Sophia's always been the my way or the highway type. She saw it coming that Ethan and I wouldn't last. But still, I can't help feeling a bit let down. Even if she didn't want to pick sides, a little support would have been nice, instead of just staying totally neutral. 
It really feels like I've been emotionally sucker punched. I don't see myself as a beggar, but the thought of Sophia telling others about my situation is downright embarrassing. Maybe she has a point somewhere in there, but I doubt she understands just how limited my options were. I was at rock bottom, sleeping on the floor at a former co-worker's place. Yet, it seems like Sophia would rather see me out on the streets than accepting help. It's a tough spot to be in, and her attitude isn't making it any easier. I'm not sure about everything, but one thing I do know is that Sophia can't even fathom the idea of me being homeless. And no, she's definitely not after Ethan. She wouldn't dare jeopardize her own marriage. Sure, she admits Ethan's a looker, but in her eyes, he's just too unreliable and not her type at all. They've stayed good friends mainly because they mingle in the same elite social circles. I was Sophia's friend first, but honestly, I've never quite managed to blend in with their wealthier crowd. It's like we're from different worlds. I like to believe that I'm smart too, even though life has thrown some tough challenges my way. I've always done the best I could, living carefully, saving money, sticking to the rules. But despite all my efforts, it feels like everything I worked for just vanished in a flash. Ethan's been incredibly kind through all this, and sometimes that makes me feel guilty about the complex mix of emotions I have. There are times when he wants to talk a lot, and I feel almost obligated to spend time with him, considering the kindness he's shown me. It's a complicated situation, with gratitude and obligation all tangled up. Ethan might have a ton of friends, but beneath it all, he seems pretty lonely. I've even heard him crying in his sleep, something he never used to do. It's clear he doesn't like being alone. I've been making an effort to show my gratitude to him, and he seems genuinely happy to hear it. He's told me I can stay as long as I need to, even forever if that's what it takes. But deep down, I'm eagerly looking forward to saving enough money to find an apartment I can call my own, a place where I can start anew. He's becoming too close and too affectionate, and that's a problem for me. There's still a part of me that holds feelings for him, and his actions keep stirring up those old emotions. So no, I can't say I'm happy. That would be too strong a word. I'm too heartbroken for that. But at least I'm safe and managing all right for now. I'm actively working towards moving out. I thought I had moved past all the emotional turmoil, but being this close to him again, it's clear I'm still hurting. The healing process, it seems, still has a way to go. Update. A couple of days after my post, Sophia reached out and apologized for using harsh words. I accepted her apology, but things were still uncomfortable for me. She said she found an apartment I could live in. It was on the first floor and had access to public transportation. The rent was high, but not out of my budget. I would be living with three other people in the apartment. I checked it out and it was acceptable. I told Ethan that Sophia had found an apartment for me and he flipped out. He said I couldn't live there because it was a dangerous part of town. We discussed it and came to a compromise. He would feel better if we went to a hotel in the area for a few days. But one morning, a man followed me. It was really scary what Ethan pointed out. He saw it as clear evidence that the area just wasn't safe. When I spoke to him about it, I admitted that staying here was my only option for now, unless I wanted to move back to my parents' house and start job hunting all over again, or maybe crash on a friend's couch. But going back to my parents isn't simple. They live in a developing country and I'm not fluent in the language there. So for me, that's an absolute last resort, something I'd only consider if I had no other choice left. Ethan reminded me of his offer, saying I could stay as long as I needed. Just like I told him before, I don't want to become a burden. His offer was incredibly generous, but I know I can't lean on his kindness forever. He suggested that Sophia might be influencing my thoughts. In response, I once again offered to pay him rent, and this time, to my surprise, he agreed. But he deliberately wastes rent money on silly things to prove a point. I told him that, but he said if I didn't like it, I could stop paying or pay him another way. I dropped the conversation. Sophia asked me why I hadn't moved into the apartment. I said I was paying rent to Ethan and she chewed me out. Sophia and Ethan's social circles overlap. So Ethan found out about how Sophia was saying I chose to stay there, even when she found me a new place to live. He got into an argument with me and said that I should stop talking to Sophia. He made an ultimatum of him or Sophia. I chose him. Since then, he's been very happy. I'm happy to see how cheerful he is, but I can't handle the constant hugs, snuggles, or pinching. It makes me feel bad and dredges up bad thoughts. I feel inadequate and crushed because he may be able to be platonic friends with me, but I still haven't gotten past the hurt. On a positive note, I started physical therapy and signed up for a free counseling program through my work. I'm working with a really tight budget, so I've got to make every penny count. Nicely handled, Opie. You guys know I'm not a fan of ultimatums, but 
In this scenario, I'd say it's the one time they're justified because, let's be honest, Sophia is being completely unreasonable. When it comes down to it, there's hardly any choice at all. It's like deciding between something sweet like a cupcake and something totally awful, like a turd. And again, Opie, I gotta say, I keep thinking that Sophia was the one that caused your divorce and that Ethan regrets it. And that's why he's so happy with having you in the house. He just doesn't know how to say it. Maybe that's just me living in Neverland, but I don't know. What do you guys think anyways? Here's wishing you the best in the future. Opie's story. I'm 26 and my ex-girlfriend is 25. We had been together for around a year. A few weeks back, we were chilling with some of her friends. Not the one in question though. We got into playing this quiz game. And one of the questions that came up was about cheating. I made a comment about how much I despise cheaters. And right after that, I caught one of her friends giving my ex-girlfriend a peculiar look. And I also noticed my ex-girlfriend got a bit uncomfortable. It was weird and got me thinking. The next day I asked my ex-girlfriend about it. She said that she wasn't going to lie and admitted that she cheated on her ex with a friend. This was a year before she met me. I felt upset about it because she'd never mentioned it before and I asked her what had happened. After my comment about cheaters, she confessed something shocking. She admitted that once when she was drunk, she hooked up with her friend. Let's call him Jack. Jack wasn't just any friend. He was a former friend with benefits and they were still hanging out quite often. I was aware of my ex-girlfriend's history with Jack, and even though I wasn't thrilled about them spending time together, I tried to be cool with it. But finding out that she cheated with him, and that she was still in regular contact with him, hit me really hard. It was a double blow, learning not only that she was unfaithful, but also that she was still close to the guy she cheated with. I told her I needed some time to think, and after two days, I decided to break up with her. I didn't want to tell her that she couldn't be friends with Jack, and I knew I couldn't deal with her still being friends with him so I just removed myself. So am I the whole. Oh wow, no, of course you're not the a-hole. You've just made one of the most mature decisions I've come across on a subreddit in quite a while. Instead of trying to control who she can or can't be friends with, which is about setting boundaries, you faced a different situation. You discovered that your girlfriend did something completely against your values, not with a stranger, but with someone she continued to associate with. That's a tough spot to be in, and your response to it shows a lot of maturity. And you just decided, well, I don't have time for this drama, I'm moving on. And so then I say, well, good for you, OPI. That is a mature decision to make. Maybe some other people would actually go the route of saying, I don't want you to be friends with Jack. And you know, try to work on that and let's set up some boundaries here and there. But your boundary is just, did you cheat? Yes. Are you still friends with that cheater? Yes, well, I'm out. And as I said, that is an absolutely valid boundary to set and that's it. So, well, good for you. OPI totally and absolutely not. The a-hole. And what do you guys think? What is your judgment or how would you have handled this situation? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Now, let's check out what the community has to say about this. Jackman1651 commented, One intense argument with you and another drunken night with Jack nearby seems a bit too risky, right? Not cool. Friends with benefits can be a tricky situation. You saw the warning signs but still continued the relationship without insisting she cut ties with him. It's a complex situation for sure, since they are friends. Then you cut her off for a really mature decision of not wanting to control who she can hang out with. You have a good set of morals on you and made a really informed decision and confident you'll find someone who won't have this dynamic for you to come to terms with. Conscious Birthday 90 says, buddy, how can I put this? It's highly likely that nobody but you will ever really take charge of looking after your mental health. Some people will try to contribute, but in the grand scheme of things, their help will be insignificant. Others will help accidentally by being decent human beings. But really, it's mostly all on you, and always will be. I strongly suggest you do it when you removed yourself. You definitely handled it well. Well done. Not the jerk here. Lady Reds chimed in with, Definitely not the jerk. Don't make someone your priority when you're just an option to them. In her case, omitting the truth is as good as lying. She lied to you by omission every time she hung out with him. Yes, she ultimately told you the truth, but the real issue is trust. If you feel like you can't trust her, that's the bottom line. That's a perfectly fine reason to walk. And what about the option thing I mentioned? If she truly loved and respected you, she'd have been honest from the start and prioritized you enough to give you the option to decide how to proceed. Best to you. Additional information from OP's comments. I'm not going to tell her who she can and can't be friends with. Totally refuse to be one of those controlling boyfriends. But here's the twist. I didn't even feel the need to test her by asking her to stop seeing Jack. Why? 
because in my eyes, she'd already made her choice loud and clear when she decided to keep hanging out with him, even though she was with me. The real kicker? I was in the dark about the whole situation, but she knew exactly what was going on. She had all the facts, and she chose to keep me out of the loop. I don't want to be with someone who hangs out with someone they cheated with, basically. If she can't tell me why this is such an issue without me having to point it out, we shouldn't be together. And for those of you trying to justify cheating with lines like cheating has roots in not getting what you need from a partner and looking elsewhere, F off with that. If you're not getting what you need from a partner, then break up. If you use that to excuse any past cheating, then I hope your current partners never failed to provide what you need. And I bet the person you cheated with wouldn't mind though, specifically since you're still in touch. Update. About a week after I posted my original post, my ex-girlfriend dropped by my place. She came up to me saying she wanted us to get back together, claiming it was silly for us to break up over this. But I laid it out for her. I was just not cool with her being friends with Jack. She tried to brush off her fling with Jack as a mistake and something that belonged in the past, insisting she's changed since then. But I shot back, doesn't really seem like it to me. I mean, how could I just brush that under the rug? She goes out drinking with Jack very often, and you two were effing after you and your ex broke up. They were friends with benefits before and after her ex. I told her I'm just not taking a chance to be her next sucker. Then she said, what if I cut off Jack? Can we get back together? Then I was tempted for a second. To be honest, our relationship had seemed pretty solid, but then I remembered some comments from my last post. So I just went for it and asked her straight up, have you been hooking up with Jack since we split? Man, you should have seen her face. It was the worst attempt at a poker face I've ever seen. She totally stumbled over her words. When she finally spoke, I just gave her this look like, yeah, right, that's total BS. She must have caught on to my disbelief because then she quickly added, I mean, we were broken up as if that made it all okay. I just put my hands up and said, nope. I then asked her to leave. She was really upset and winning. Like I said, OP, good for you. 